Doing good, doing good. Well, you know, it's a busy day here at the distillery. Got this big expansion going on, lots of work being done, lots of bourbon being put into barrels, which is great news. But today's a special day because we have a really fun tasting planned for you. I'm excited. Hope you are too. And for all you guys watching at home, remember to drop your questions in the comments and uh, we'll try to get them answered for you as we go. So, Bill, tell us a little bit about this tasting in front of you. Yeah. So, what we have here is a good uh, representation of the timeline of Buffalo Trace Distillery. Um, the name has changed over the years, but really the people, the location, we've been making whiskey here for the last 200 plus years. So, today, what you guys have asked me to do is talk about 200 years of history in about 20 minutes. Um, so I might go down a few rabbit holes and I apologize to you folks in advance if I do do that. Um, there's a lot that I want to say that we're probably not going to get to. So please come visit and learn all this history for yourself. So starting over here at the right, we have White Dog Whiskey. And rewind the clock to 1973, I'm sorry, 1973, 1773. So in 1773, America is not a country, Kentucky is not a state. We are making whiskey right here. It is essentially the Leestown settlement and you had pot stills and farmers making whiskey and the vast majority of them are using corn, rye, malted barley. So the distillery, we have basically have 200 years of experience and the next few are gonna kind of take us through that experience. So in the beginning, this was just one of the original places where American whiskey was being made. And at the time, it's more pot stills and farmers, whatever grain you couldn't sell, you're gonna distill and make whiskey out of. Well, the industry grew a lot and changed a lot. So about 75 years later, 1849, America is a country and Kentucky is a state, so 1776, we're a country, and in 1776, George Washington saw that the country was in debt after the Revolutionary War, saw that the Caribbeans were taxing uh, rum, making a lot of money on it, so, whisk or, so George Washington started taxing whiskey. Well, everybody got out of essentially the areas that were being governed to go to an area where they could make their whiskey without it being taxed, Long story short, the state of Kentucky was made 1792, uh, and when they declared it a state, they declared the entire state the county of Bourbon County. The Bourbon family was French royalty that helped out during the Revolutionary War. So now we have whiskey being made in Kentucky, and it's being made out of corn, rye, malted barley, and the distilleries are set up on the highways of the time, which are the rivers. So. Buffalo Trace Distillery sits on the Kentucky River. If you want to take a barrel and fill it with whiskey, it's 500, 600 pounds. To get that to New York from here, you're not going to take it over the Appalachian Mountains. So you're going to fill a barrel of whiskey, put it on the Kentucky River, take your raft to the Ohio River, take that to the Mississippi, and that'll take you down to New Orleans. And in New Orleans, all of these barrels at this time is starting to show up and they're all getting uh, stamped with a stamp that says Kentucky Bourbon County Whiskey. Bourbon is not a thing yet. It's just all these barrels getting Kentucky Bourbon County Whiskey. So eventually that turns into bourbon, that bourbon street came from there. And so New Orleans was kind of an early hub um, and actually where Sazerac Rye, the Sazerac cocktail came from New Orleans. Well, 75 years later now, whiskey is this thing and you have William LaRue Weller. So this is 1849 and William Leroux Weller starts his distillery. And instead of using rye as a flavoring grain, so instead of corn, rye, malted barley, William Leroux Weller chose to use wheat. So corn, wheat, malted barley. It makes for a little bit of a softer, easier to drink whiskey. So this is our William Leroux Weller, delicious, easier to drink. You know, it's almost like comparing wheat bread to rye bread. Simple as that. Well. Interestingly enough, William LaRue Weller hired Pappy Van Winkle, and Pappy Van Winkle was tasked to go around the country and sell Weller bourbon, the first weeded recipe bourbon. So Sazerac has always been a privately owned company, Buffalo Trace Distillery, privately owned. 
So when we worked with the Van Winkle family and we owned the original weeded recipe, you know, we got to make that arrangement with the Pappy Van Winkle years later. Well, so a few years after uh, when Lou Reller came out with his weeded recipe, E.H. Taylor gets involved in the industry. So 1870s now, E.H. Taylor was born in Kentucky, moved to New Orleans, and was working in the finance industry and was actually raised by Zachary Taylor. A lot of his customers were distillers. And he realized there's a lot of money in this industry and he was quite interested in it. So E.H. Taylor went and did a little tour of Europe, learned all about distilling and learned how to make it in a you know, more methodical way. And ultimately what he did was James Crow and E.H. Taylor focused on the process. They make it a superior process. We're gonna build really nice aging warehouses um, just dialed up. And so what I say is he bridged the gap from pot stills and farmers to the modern bourbon industry. Um, really kind of set the stage for today. So at the time, you might have heard us talk about the OFC distillery. So the OFC distillery was the original distillery that E.H. Taylor built here on this uh, property. And he was making barrels of OFC whiskey. Well, come along, it's now 1978, so, or 1878, eight years after E.H. Taylor's been here, George T. Stagg is involved. George T. Stagg was a salesman, and he was selling barrels of OFC whiskey. So at the time, whiskey was not going into bottles. Whiskey was going into barrels sitting on a back bar, and you'd fill up your growler from the back bar. So George T. Stagg respected the E.H. Taylor whiskey, wanted to get involved, and started basically becoming his distributor. Well, there, if you can't see, but I'm looking at the Buffalo Trace Distillery grounds behind you, behind the camera, um, and they're very pretty. And it's because E.H. Taylor went bankrupt building this place. The only reason it was able to happen is because George C. Stagg came and bailed him out. So George C. Stagg basically said, hey, I know you're in financial trouble. I love your whiskey. I want to keep helping, so I'm going to buy you out. And together, they really went from basically, you know, once said modernize the bourbon industry, they did it together. So George C. Stagg basically prevented Taylor from just complete bankruptcy and just dropping the ball because he was overdoing it and Stagg was being a little more methodical. So eventually George C. Stagg is running the show and he saw this distillery grow with him and E.H. Taylor's um, partnership. So like Warehouse C, 1881, massive limestone base, big brick structure, and he would say quality bourbon deserves a quality aging environment. Nobody's doing aging warehouses at that time. so. Um, and you'd say, distillery looks like a castle, it ought to be fit for a king. Just way ahead of the game. Well, George T. Stagg then eventually hired Albert Blanton. So we are now in 1921. Albert Blanton, I'm actually looking at the farm he grew up on, which is right over here. Uh, Albert Blanton grew up on a farm adjacent to the distillery and was hired in 1921 and was actually was hired before 1921, but in 1921, he was deemed the president of Buffalo Trace Distillery. So what is not fun for Albert Blanton is 1921, he took over the distillery. There are 14 buildings on the property. He got to deal with Prohibition, Great Depression, and World War II, and a great flood of 1937. And somehow, while dealing with all of that, he grew the distillery from 14 buildings to 144 buildings. So alcohol is illegal, the country is in dire shape, the world is at war, and whiskey is doing great. Um, so his tutelage really got us through that. He did things like when you're done with grain after you make your bourbon, you have a high protein grain left. And there's old schematics from when Taylor was around where it showed us pumping the grain to a slop trough for cattle. Well, Albert Blanton had the government subsidize a dry house, which let us dry out the grain and use it to help the troops during World War II for, with the high protein grain. So way ahead of his time. Um, well, and it, of course, you know, one unique fact about Buffalo Trace Distillery is that it's, it didn't shut down during Prohibition. Yes. Uh, we were, we were the longest continuously operating distillery. So it is a fluid movement from 
beginning to end. I mean, and really, once you get to E.H. Taylor, Taylor, Stagg, Blanton, Elmer, Harlan, there hadn't been a gap. So Harlan got to learn from Elmer, Elmer learned from Blanton, Blanton from Stagg, Stagg from Taylor. So it's just a continuous run. And that's when I say, you know, the people haven't changed. The name might have changed over the years. But, you know, when you hear Harlan talking about a decision Elmer made in 1949 and why he did it, it's very, you know, helpful. So it really is, you know, it's a culmination of 200 years of learning. And, and legends of, of the bourbon industry. Yes. Icons. Yes. Yeah. Um, so Blanton, you know, this is his bottle. So he actually had a warehouse built. He was 1921 to 1954, somewhere in there. Uh, in 1934, he had a warehouse built, and it's a metal warehouse. And we are currently sitting in Albert Blanton's house. So between 1921 and 19, or actually 1934 and 1950, Albert Blanton would throw parties up at this house. And his warehouse that he built is right down there, which again, you can't see. Um, and he would send the warehouse crew down there to grab a barrel out of the warehouse that he built, that was his favorite warehouse, bring it up here, serve it to the guests, and share at the party. Well, Elmer T. Lee was hired by Albert Blanton, and in 1984, Elmer had the idea of picking one barrel out of the Blanton's warehouse, just like he used to do, bottling it as a single barrel and calling it Blanton's. So, 1984, we've been making Blanton's here ever since. Now, I'm going to bring this guy back over here, because now we're getting caught up to modern times. So, basically, early 2000s, we launch these brands, Eagle Air, Buffalo Trace. And what is very unique about these brands is we were able to take what we've learned and take what we've built and utilize that to make older whiskey than normal. So a 10 year old single barrel bourbon was launched, Eagle Air. At that time, doing a 10 year old single barrel bourbon didn't make a lot of sense. There weren't other people doing it. But we had learned that people want a variety of whiskey, people enjoy the age, and we aren't going to sacrifice taste for short-term profits. And, you know, we could make more if we made this younger. But, you know. So, um, ultimately, Eagle Rare and Buffalo Trace are a great example of 200 years of learning. So Buffalo Trace is a seven to eight year old small batch bourbon, which essentially means small batch means you are going to have a different set of barrels go into the bottling every time. And Eagle Rare was a 10 year old single barrel bourbon. So you can kind of see the difference in variety uh, that we can produce. And really when you go across all the brands, you get a great example of the variety we've produced. And so our motto here is honor tradition, embrace change. And you can see the change and the tradition just by lining up the bottles. Um, obviously, I didn't even taste these as we're talking because my favorite part of all this is the history. I, I love the brands, the distillery, and you could do real people, real stories. Well, hey, it, you know, it's never too late. We've got a lot of people tuning in. As you know, it's Connecticut, Jacksonville, Florida. I mean, people, people from everywhere. So let's, um, let's do them justice and let's, let's give them a taste. Okay, yeah. So we're going to go to the white dog first. So this is bourbon before it goes into the barrel. So it's not bourbon yet until it touches the barrel. So essentially you got 125 proof whiskey, the dominant grain is corn, and it's surprisingly good. Um, I wouldn't just like sip on it myself for fun, but if you just moonshine essentially, it's very tasty. Um, you know, the barrel adds so much of the flavor, the color. The distillate is where you still pull in a lot of the sweetness from the corn and things like that. So you can, you know, what's fun to do, this is, if you've ever been on the, the Freddie Johnson tour, <laughs> he, um, stuck. He'll, he'll do, oh, I'm not just this one. He'll do what he calls walking the dog. So he puts a little white dog on his hand and you rub it. And at first it's like all alcohol and you're like, but then when your hands start drying, you can get all the grain that came through. So you'll get the corn, you'll get the barley, get the rye. Uh, it's a great way to kind of just look at the white dog. So Weller, easy to drink, fan favorite. Um, this is one of the more, I say it's delicate. You know, 
often with bourbon, I feel like people kind of categorize them in two ways. It's beauty and the beast. There's the beauty is easy to drink, delightful, share it with anybody, even if they've never had bourbon. And Weller to me is a great entry bourbon. It's smooth, um, not a big kick in the mouth. Opposite end would be stag. This is the beast. Uh, tons of complexity, a lot going on, high proof, unfiltered. So Weller, beautiful, easy to drink. We should drink more Weller. Hmm. Yeah. And then against the white dog, you can just kind of see where it goes crazy. So uh, next one, E.H. Taylor, small batch, um, variety of barrels, variety of ages, meaning to be bottled in bond, you have to have the same age of barrels each bottling. So one year's batch might be eight years, one year's batch could be nine years. So that's one variety of ages. Also delicious. Of all the tailors, this is the one you should be able to get your hands on. Um, it is the most widely distributed and isn't as crazy as some of those expressions. Right, so, you know, might be worth mentioning that Weller and NEH Taylor, there are a lot of expressions um, out there uh, for both these brands, but these two you see in front of us are, are, you know, your most common, the most, probably most easy to get your hands on, so. Yeah, um, Taylor, a lot of, you know, our motto, honor tradition, embrace change, pretty much originated from Taylor. He was a innovator beyond anybody. Um, and he still used their traditional methods, but he's innovated. And so a lot of our, you know, cool, like the four grain, amaranth, things like that, those started out as experiments and it fit perfectly with the Taylor brand because it was so, so innovative. Uh, innovative. Um, so then George T. Stagg. So as my buddy Gene Charnas in at Warehouse Liquors in Illinois, uh, he's a longtime customer, and he always says, I like more whiskey in my whiskey, which essentially means you take white dog, you put it in a barrel, and then nine years later, you dump it out into bottles. Something like Weller, you take white dog, you put it into a barrel, and then seven, eight years later, well, seven years later, you add a little bit of water to get it down to 90 proof. You filter it to get some of those oils, fatty acids, things that kind of look like floaters, make it a nice, cleaner, prettier bottle. And stag, you're not doing that. It's uncut, unfiltered, right to the face. Um, generally, people will start here, and the more bourbon they drink, they go here. People want more proof, more flavor. Uh, so a lot of those oils and fatty acids will add flavor. Um, well, we've got a, a pretty cool question from um, from Gerald about E. H. Taylor. He says, um, "What is the year stamp on the on the top of the label there?" The year stamp on the top of the label. So, you are referring to is some of these old mm -hmm. uh, strip stamps would say distilled and bottled. You know, it'd say fall or spring. This one we don't put them on there. So this E. H. Taylor does not have a age. You know, a distilled or bottled date. But a lot of the older ones will say, you know, distilled in spring 1950 and then bottled fall 1955. Well, of course, you know, E.H. Taylor was, was instrumental in the Bottled and Bond Act, right? Yep. Yeah. So Bottled and Bond is what this tax strip rep represents. So at the time where I said George T. Stagg was purchasing barrels of OFC whiskey, OFC whiskey was being ripped off by a lot of people. Uh, EH said it referred to as imitation whiskey. So other distillers, whether or not they were trying to do a good job or trying to pull the wool over somebody's eyes, would essentially try to copy his brand. And it was bad for the consumers, and Taylor knew that. And there's a parallel track of the government has always had troubles taxing alcohol in the sense of they would do things like a alcohol tax in 1776 and it caused the whiskey rebellion. People just got out of the places where they were taxing it. And, and then before the, basically before the income tax in 1908, somewhere around there, 
um, alcohol was the largest source of revenue for the country. Well, then eventually there was a revenuer and a distiller working together to circumvent the tax again. So there's been all these issues with collecting tax. So what Taylor did is he saw two problems and helped fix them. One problem was collecting tax, so the government could actually have a good feel of what's going on. And the other was consumer trust. So Taylor said, we are going to work with the government to say, if we put this tax strip on, it is verifiable by the government to the consumer. And the government can then use that to make sure they're collecting their tax money. So it was a pretty smart thing, but it was also the first Consumer Protection Act. Um, again, it set the scene for today. You know, bourbon still wasn't officially bourbon at, when he was doing this. Um, wow. Very Good cool. question. Yeah, well, I mean, you can see there's been lots of innov innovation, um, lots of change, but also a lot of tradition and a lot of honoring that tradition and the history that um, that we see and feel here at Buffalo Trace Distillery. So, but guys, that's all we've got for today. Uh, Bo, thank you for your time. Um, thank you for having me. I've enjoyed I'll it. I'll drink the rest of these when the camera is That's right. That, yeah, watch out. Um, hope you guys at, at home enjoyed it too. And as always, we'll be back here next week live at 2 p.m. Uh, for another episode of Whiskey Wednesday. See you then.